do you, you believe that it is a baby in the womb? Um, I mean, it's a seed. At first, it grows into a baby. At what point does it become a baby? I think it's, is it like two, three months? Do you know? Uh, I have no idea. I don't ever have babies in me. A answer this question. It's okay to kill a baby in the womb when? Uh, um... So do you believe that it's a baby inside the womb? Of course. So what else would it be? <laughs> if it's like a still a ball of cells, then yeah, I think that you, could, you should be able to have an abortion. We're in America, right? People are like, eh, it's just a clump of cells. It's not human. I'm like, yeah, it's human. It's alive. Those are unarguable facts. And I would absolutely kill a baby right now if I needed to. I don't care, man. I think that if you need my organs, you can go yourself. If we get pregnant, we get pregnant. Like, I don't think you should bring somebody into the world if you're not prepared for it. As women, we should be able to have a choice. I've had an abortion. If somebody told me that they murdered somebody, I wouldn't take it upon myself to judge them. I really don't believe in abortions, though. I ain't gonna lie, but I don't, I don't care. There should be a safe way to get rid of a baby. Do you think a 13-year-old girl and a 42-year-old male consensually should be able to have sex. No, this should never be. Her body, her choice. I'm, I'm rethinking my pro, my pro choice thing. There have been more than 61 million abortions in the United States since it became legal in 1973. It is estimated that somewhere between 35 to 45 million abortions are performed each year worldwide. Literally everyone has an opinion. Stephen, how do you feel about abortion? It's really up to the person who's carrying the child. I'm not against it. At the end of the day, it should be the mother's decision. That's your choice. So you don't agree with it, but is it up to the individual to decide? Yes. So is getting an abortion the same as removing one's fingernails or removing a lung? I asked people out on the street if they would kill it, but I didn't tell them what it is. They didn't have any context as to what I was talking about. Kathy, would you kill it? Would I kill what? What? Would you kill it? Kill what? Kill it? Kill. Well, I would kill it if I was on the dance floor. Would I kill it? Of course I'd kill anything. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Why wouldn't you kill it, though? In order to answer that question, yeah. what do you what do you need? Like context, because <laughs> I don't know what you mean by that. <laughs> what do we miss in order to answer that question? What is it? Right, like what's the subject? Yeah. Then I asked them if they would blow up a building if they weren't sure if someone was in it. Imagine if you were the owner of a demolition company and you were hired to blow up a building. And right before you blew up the building, you saw some movement in the window. You're not sure. Maybe it was the wind causing the curtain to move. Maybe the shadow of a bird was flying overhead. You're not sure, maybe there's somebody in it, maybe not. Would you still push the button? No. Would you still blow up the building knowing that there might be somebody in there? No. That's crazy. No. No. If I was hired to blow up the building? Yeah. I would, I would make sure there's nobody in there. And how much am I getting paid? You wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do Twitter it. Twitter <laughs> This is already bad. Because it could be a person. Yeah, so that makes sense, right? Some say they don't know if it's a baby in the womb. Is it a baby in the womb? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. Now, if you don't know if the unborn are human or not, that would actually be an argument for not blowing up the building. Think about it. You cannot go through with an abortion if killing it means you might be killing an innocent human being. At what point does it become a baby? I don't know exactly. President Ronald Reagan once said, if you're out hunting and you see the bushes rustling in front of you, and you're not sure if it's a deer that you've been after or your best buddy, are you gonna open fire? Hey, I'm not sure if there's somebody in that building. You had said you're not sure if it's a baby in the womb. Would it be consistent to say, let that human being live? I never thought about that. Yeah. This isn't politics. This is common sense. Do you believe it's a baby in the womb? It depends. It is a baby in the womb. If prenatal personhood is established, the case for abortion collapses, for the fetus's right to life would then be guaranteed specifically by the 14th Amendment. 
So says Harry Blackman, who presided on the case of Roe v. Wade back in January 1973. And at what, what stage? Does it become a human before it comes out of the birth canal, or does it become a human when the heart begins to beat or the brain begins to develop? Do you ever give that any thought? I think it becomes a human when it starts to develop. When it starts to develop. Well, from the moment of conception, it begins to develop, right? That's true, okay. Once we answer the question, what is the preborn? And if we answer that it is a distinct human being with a separate blood type, oftentimes from mom and dad, a different DNA, then I would come up with the premise that there are no reasons whatsoever on why we should be able to kill that preborn. There are only four differences between the preborn, which some say is not human, and the newborn, which they say is human. Let's examine those four differences and see if it still makes sense to say that it's okay to kill preborn babies, but it's not okay to kill newborn ones. The first difference between a preborn and a newborn is their size. Of course, the preborn is typically smaller than a newborn. Some even object by saying, how can you call something the size of a dot a human being? That's a good question. How can something so small be human? Well, why can't something so small be a human being? Are large people more human than small people? Men are generally larger than women. Does that mean that men deserve more rights than women? Kevin Hart and Dwayne The Rock Johnson are two different sizes. Is Kevin less valuable just because he's smaller and Dwayne Johnson more valuable just because he's bigger? If size has nothing to do with the value of a human being, then how can we say the life inside of its mother is of less value simply because it's smaller? The second difference between a preborn and a newborn is their level of development. I've heard people ask, how can something that's not fully developed yet be a person? Or how can something whose brain is still developing and who's not even self-aware be a human being? Well, imagine if your development or abilities determined your value as a person. A person's brain is still developing well into their 20s. A six-year-old's reproductive organs aren't fully developed like those of a 16-year-old. Is that six-year-old less of a person than the teenager just because she can't get pregnant yet? So what makes a baby in her mother's womb any different? The little child is as much developed as you'd expect it to be at that stage. If our level of development has nothing to do with our value as a human being, then how can we say the life inside of its mother is of less value simply because it's less developed? The third difference between a preborn and a newborn is their environment or location. Is the unborn really a person if it's not in the world yet? Well, they are in the world, just in a different location. Just think about us. Our environment is always changing, but we know our personhood always remains the same. So let me ask, if the value of personhood is determined by one's environment, does that mean our value changes when we move from place to place? Is an astronaut less human than us simply because they're no longer on this planet? If our environment or location has nothing to do with our value as human beings, then how can we say that life inside of a womb is less valuable than ours simply because it's in a different location? The last difference between a preborn and a newborn is the degree of dependency. People often ask, if the unborn is totally dependent on its mother, then how can it be a person? I'm curious, why can't something so dependent be a person? There are many people who depend on others for their survival. For example, there are those with pacemakers or who are on life support in hospitals. Others are on dialysis machines or take medicine like insulin in order to survive. Without these life-saving elements, people will die. Those inside a plane are dependent on pilots. Passengers are counting on them to get them to their destination. Similarly, babies in the womb are counting on their mother to get them safely into the world. After all, the safest place in the world should be a mother's womb.
A 20-month-old toddler can do many things, like play around and run around, but good hygiene, putting on clothes, and eating healthy are not some of them. So just because a baby still relies on her mother for all of these things, she's not any less human. So what makes a baby in a mother's womb any different? If personhood isn't determined by our degree of dependency, then how can we say that a little boy or girl's life inside of their mother's womb is less valuable than ours simply because they rely on their mother for survival? It seems pretty clear that when we look at each of the elements in the acronym SLED, size, level of development, environment, and degree of dependency, none of them define our personhood or our value as human beings. So I'm on the campus here at Cal State Fullerton in Southern California, and I'm gonna see if students are willing to be so progressive that they're willing to sign a petition to legalize late-term abortion. How late, you ask? Well, it's so late, the child has already been born post-birth abortion. Let's find out, see if anybody's crazy enough to sign this thing. Hey Chief, if you wanna sign a petition to legalize late-term abortion? Uh, sure. It's late, it's post-birth. Yeah, well, it's, it's after the child's actually been born. It's within the first 30 days is the idea, is the concept. So the child is fully healthy, fully good, but sometimes it just does a number on the parents, you know what I'm saying? And uh, we wanna make sure that they're able to do what they wanna do. Would you be interested in signing a petition to legalize late-term abortion in California? I would, but I'm a permanent resident. I'm not a oh, okay. U.S. citizen. Okay, okay. Well, thank you. She would, but she's not a U.S. citizen. Are you okay. pro-choice? Yeah. If you'd be interested in signing that. It's so late. It's actually post-birth abortion. Sometimes parents have a hard time trying to distinguish. Does that sound like something you'd be interested in? Yeah, so the child is, you know, it's fully healthy and viable and stuff, but sometimes it's just too hard on the parents, and yeah. the parents need to make that. Late term, like so late term, the child's already been born. Within the first 30 days, that's what it's been arguing before Congress. Is that wrong? I mean, I'm pro-choice, but if it's a baby already. Well, when does it become a baby? I know it gets heartbeat at eight weeks, I believe. 21 days, heart begins to beat. Brain's forming at 35 days. <laughs> I, I mean, here's the thing, I don't know. I just think, I don't, I don't know. Is it wrong for all women in all places? No, of course not. No, they can I mean, make up their own mind. Definitely cases where I think abortion is okay. Hey, want to sign a petition to legalize late term I abortion? Think Don't be late. Pick it up. Post birth abortion. Post birth. Yeah, the child's born, the child is fully healthy. I think I need to do a little bit more research. Yeah, yeah. What, are you yeah. guys pro life, pro choice? Where do you stand? Uh, we're pro choice. Okay, all right. Yeah, okay. late term abortion in California. To legalize late, late term. term abortion. It's not legal in California. It's actually so late, it's gonna, it might even shock you, it's post-birth. It's what's been I argued in Ivy League schools up to uh, 30 days after the child is born. Sometimes it's so traumatizing for the parents still. Oh, that's a hard It's progressive. Topic. It's progressive and I totally believe in woman's choice. And yeah, yeah, what do you think? <gasps> what are your thoughts? That's a, that's a hard one. That's a hard one because it is post-birth and 30 days is a long time. At the end of the day, abortion is, you know, it's up to a, a woman. What do you do you, you, you believe it's a baby in the womb? Yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just sometimes it's just too hard for somebody to decide and, yeah. you know what I'm saying? But I think they should have that option. Yeah. <laughs> okay, fair enough, but, but for the option. Yeah, so the, the child is fully, it, it could be fully healthy, it could have Down syndrome, it could be viable, whatever it may be, right? But um, That's really hard. This is craziness, right? Yeah. We are a nation that is quickly losing its moral compass. Common sense is being thrown out the window. We're a nation that believes no child should be left behind, but we've aborted over 61 million of them. We're a nation that weeps for the illegal children that are being separated from their parents at the border, yet we fight for a woman to kill her offspring. As long as we teach children that it's okay to kill children in the womb, will never convince them that it's wrong to kill children in a classroom. We live in a day and age where animals have more rights than humans. It's a crime to kill an eagle's egg, a felony to destroy a turtle's egg. Yet if a woman decides to kill her own child, we call her brave, but we say it's health care and a human right. Do uh, you know who Peter Sanger is, by any chance? He's, yes. all right, so Peter Sanger, he wrote the book on ethics, practical ethics. He's at Princeton University. 
And his book is like the go-to textbook when it comes to ethics in the Ivy League schools. Mm -hmm. And he argues that infanticide should be legal up until 29 days after the child is born for the very reason that I had brought up before you, because sometimes it could just be a little bit too difficult for the parent. I trust experts, and if this expert is saying, hey, infanticide should be good up to 29 days, like my gut reaction is no, but hey, I'm not an expert. I should read his paper. I should see what, I should like, you know, feel around. Yeah, that's actually a logical fallacy called appeal to authority. But when we look at somebody in authority and we say, hey, because they are an authority, they must be right about everything. Now, do you believe it's a baby in the womb? I believe it's a fetus. A fetus, all right. Yeah. Now, fetus is just Latin for little child. You didn't come from a toddler, you were a toddler. Yeah. You didn't come from a teenager, you were a teenager, right? Mm -hmm. The word fetus simply means a stage of life, Yeah. right? And now you're an adult. To say that it's just a fetus, kind of trying to skirt around the issue. If it's like just some cells, like, yeah, I think you can terminate it. It's just cells, it's not formed yet. Listen, you're a clump of cells and it's okay to grow slow. We're having a clump of cells, said no one ever. People are like, eh, it's just a clump of cells, it's not human. I'm like, yeah, it's human, it's alive. Those are unarguable facts. I will agree with you till the cows come home. That is human and it is alive. So you do believe it's a baby in the womb? That's a human being right there. It is. We all know that. Black Parents are fine. When you consider again, what month is that a person is alive? Well, it's, a li it's alive from fertilization. No, see, I don't, I don't believe that. Well, you're, you're a doctor. Know, when does it become alive? But I, you know, it's, it's a mood, okay. You're a doctor. The science of embryology. Okay, I don't, I'm not going to The science of biogenesis. I'm not going to argue that. It can be kind of tricky talking with a doctor about life science when he doesn't want to talk about it. Don't be like that. Don't put your fingers in your ear not wanting to engage in civil dialogue. The sciences are settled on this. The unborn are living human beings from the moment of fertilization. The science of biogenesis means that each species will bring forth life after its own species. That's why we don't see a cat turning into a dog, right? Remember the question that needs to be answered is simple. What is it? What is the unborn? And for that answer, we go to the Bible and it says, each species will bring forth after its own kind. This is known as the science of biogenesis. We will never have a butterfly turning into a lion or a horse turning into a goldfish. Cats produce cats, dogs produce dogs, and human beings produce human beings. Now, biogenesis is not the only science we turn to. There's also the science of embryology, and that science is as equally clear. From the earliest stages of development, each of us was a distinct, living, and whole human being. Even Peter Singer, a bioethicist at Princeton University, supporter of both infanticide and abortion wrote, whether a being is a member of a given species is something that can be determined scientifically by an examination of the nature of the chromosomes in the cells of living organisms. In this sense, there's no doubt that from the first moments of its existence, an embryo conceived from human sperm and eggs is a human being. According to Princeton University, life begins at fertilization. So you're left with either denying science or explaining why you support the killing of babies. So here's why we are pro-life. Number one, the murder of innocent human beings created in the image of God is always wrong. Number two, abortion is the murder of innocent human beings. And lastly, therefore, abortion is always wrong. Why is murder wrong to you? I just think it's morally wrong. Common sense, I don't know where it came from. If you believe that killing somebody else's life and taking somebody else's life, it's like, that's pathetic. That's pathetic. Since the beginning of time, people have attempted to dehumanize certain human beings. Take Rosa Parks, for instance. Rosa Parks was the American civil rights activist best known for not moving to the back of the bus on December 1st, 1955. The U.S. Congress has called her the First Lady of Civil Rights and the Mother of the Freedom Movement. She was ordered to relinquish her seat and allow a white person to sit there. Do you know what motivated her? In part, it was the story of Emmett Till, a 14-year-old black man who was brutally murdered after he reportedly flirted with a young white woman while visiting relatives in Mississippi. The woman's husband and his brother brutally beat and shot young Emmett in the head. 
The husband was quoted as saying, what else could I do? He thought he was as good as any white man. They then threw his body in the river. His corpse was sent home to his family, where they decided they would have an open casket so the world could see what discrimination and racism look like. Emmett's picture was on the cover of newspapers and magazines all across the US, and it motivated Rosa Parks to take a stand. Even though Rosa didn't leave her seat, she did move over to allow room for a fellow human. Even so, we should be making room for every human being, especially those who are most vulnerable, babies in the womb. Because we bear God's image, it's wrong to murder our fellow man. God says it's wrong. That's why it's wrong. Yes. That's it. I don't believe we should murder human babies. In the same way, I don't think we should murder adolescents or teens or adults or the elderly. Consider the most popular arguments one gives to support abortion within our society. But if, if the woman was raped, she should have the choice to have an abortion. Okay. All right, so in cases of rape, let's throw in incest. That's less than 1% of all the abortions that take place, right? But she should be allowed to do it. So do you think we should ever punish a child for the crime of the father? No, should, I mean, you should have him have, wait, why would the child be punished though? Both the mother and the preborn are both victims. You don't kill one victim to make the other feel better about themselves. Is it right to punish a child for the crime of the father? No, not at all, not at all. Think about it for a moment. When you use the excuses of rape and incest to justify abortion, you're saying that rape and incest survivors are sick people who don't deserve to live. What if it's my six-year-old pregnant with that baby? What if she got raped, you know, and I got her back and she was pregnant and she's six years old? Are we gonna go into this like raping and thing? Cause if we are, then I'm not gonna talk about that. That would tear her up. Imagine a mother deciding to keep the child until the child's three years old. Looking over at the child and saying, you know what? This child is a product of rape. And because this child is a product of rape, I'm gonna kill the child. Would it ever be acceptable after the child is born to kill the child in cases of rape? Probably not, no. Um, not in America, no. <laughs> I hate, I hate that question. So, no. so we shouldn't punish a child for the crime of the father. I don't think so. So even though rape is a terrible thing or incest is a terrible thing, we shouldn't punish the child. No. 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 We don't get to choose what kinds of people matter. <laughs> you right. <laughs> you right, bro. You see, so if it doesn't work outside the womb, why does it work inside the womb? We say because, well, it's not fully developed yet. So a five-year-old isn't fully developed yet. The reproductive organs aren't there. They can't, you know, have a baby. But it's as fully developed as you would imagine it to be at that stage. Not my place to go and tell somebody, you know, how to live their life. It's not for whether me or you to say, hey, you can or can't do it. As a woman, I think that that is their choice. Our society tells us, you're a man, and therefore you don't have a say. Attacking men for their gender is simply an attempt to short circuit honest dialogue. I think women should be in charge of their own bodies. Now, when you say it's her body, are you saying that the baby in the womb is actually part of her body, like an appendix or a lung or a heart? I think it's part of her body. Yeah. It's actually part of her body, right? So she has 20 fingers, she has 20 toes. If she's pregnant with a male, then she's part male and part female. Is that your position? The woman? Yeah. It's part of her yeah, body. Yeah, yeah. All right, so if she's pregnant with two twin boys, she's mostly male and not female. Okay, yes. Consider for a moment that the words her body, her choice, have been smuggled into the conversation. Those words don't apply to the argument at hand. Hot coffee over hot chocolate is a choice. USC over UCLA is a choice. Chocolate cake over a cheeseburger is a choice. But when we're talking about a baby in the womb who has no voice, then it takes people like you and I that are gonna step up and be a voice for the voiceless and give hope for the hopeless. If a 13-year-old cannot donate blood, if a 13-year-old cannot catch a rated R movie without parental consent, why should a 13-year-old be able to walk into a Planned Parenthood and get an abortion without parental consent? Should not be able to do that. Good afternoon, this is Autumn. Hello, Autumn. I'm interested in making a donation today. Fantastic. What about abortions for the underprivileged minority groups? I want to specify that abortion to help a minority group. Would that be possible? Absolutely. Like the black community, for example? Certainly. Okay. So 
so the abortion could could be you know I could give money specifically for a black baby that would that be the purpose yeah absolutely um, if you wanted to designate that you wanted your gift to be used to help an african-american woman in need mm-hmm. um, then we would certainly uh, make sure that that gift was earmarked specifically for that purpose great because I really face trouble with affirmative action and I don't want my kids being disadvantaged you know against um, black kids I just had a baby I want to put it in his name you know, mm-hmm. um, you know so that's that's definitely yeah. possible oh always always and we just think you know the, the, the less the less black kids out there the better <laughs> understandable understandable all right um, excuse my hesitation I'm, I'm this is the first time I've had a donor call and ask, make this kind of request sure. so I'm excited and I'm, I want to make sure I don't leave anything out one of the most tragic stories of racism is the horrific story of Oda Benga. Oda was a pygmy who was featured at the Bronx Zoo in a human exhibit in 1906 after being purchased from African slave traders for some salt and fabric. The zoo's attendance doubled from the previous year with onlookers desiring to see what was dubbed as the missing link. At 23 years old and with a height just under five feet, he weighed 103 pounds. He was given a bow and arrow, placed with the monkeys, and was told to shoot it when people were watching. The bigotry he experienced was severely disturbing, and Oda, sadly, took his own life about 10 years later. The story of Oda Benga is one of the many tragic fruits of Darwinian evolution that robbed a man of his humanity. When we teach children that they are nothing more than evolved primates, we cannot be surprised when they act like it. May we all learn the fundamental lesson and the important truth that all men are created in the image of God and are worthy of respect, honor, and dignity. If people had stood up for Oda's personhood, this horror story might have been prevented. What what do you think about maybe abortion if, if the child is deformed? No, <laughs> like, I don't think so, no. There's so many people that are deformed and they got parents and a family that loves them. It's like, they're still a person. <laughs> what well, if think about what we do, right? We give preferential treatment to those with disabilities. Park up towards the front of the store or we'll let sit at the front of the bus. Right, we don't kill them, we give them preferential treatment. Maybe the government should allocate the money that they give towards Planned Parenthood and instead give it towards foster care and adoption services. Is, is adoption a viable option? Yeah, but I mean, like I know adoption homes aren't the best. Wasn't like, a good I was place. A foster kid and like, I, I'm okay, I think, you know? So it's hard to say, it's hard You're to okay, say. You're okay, right? Yeah. yeah. Would you say it's better than killing off the child though? Or would the child be able to have a say in it? Well, I'm child, just playing devil's advocate for you. I know, but I mean, the child can't speak. Like, yeah. I don't, you know. Like, is that the criteria? As long as they can't speak. No, I mean no. But why? Why is a woman's not saying this more important than the child? The child's not born yet. Yeah. You know, like, is it? What if the child could feel pain? Would that matter? Can it? I think that would be irrelevant, because if somebody's in a coma, they can't feel pain. Right. And just because they can't feel pain doesn't give me the right to go lop off somebody's arm, <laughs> right? Yeah, or they're yeah. sleeping, okay, yeah. <laughs> right? The um, safe place where we're supposed to send them when they're not safe with their mom isn't safe. No. It's statistically proven. So that needs to get fixed. If we're gonna say, okay, all children are gonna be born. The foster care and adoption services available are far from perfect. The quality of one's life, it's not the basis for determining whether a person should live or die. When you use the excuse of unwanted children should therefore justify abortion, you're saying that unwanted members of our society are repulsive people who don't deserve to live. I certainly don't believe we should kill kids in a broken system just because their living situation isn't a white picket fenced life. Of course, you know, my mom, my mom had my sister in high school, so for her, you know, it was it was glad easy. she was born, right? Exactly. So it wasn't it wasn't easy for her, but every day when she sees the woman that my sister's becoming and the fact that my sister has her own children now, she's kinda she's like, it was all worth it. You know what I mean? I believe everything has a chance. I mean you if 
I don't know, every life, every living thing in this place, in this world has a chance regardless. No matter what it is, like you still have a chance to either make your life better or make the life worse, it's up to you. You know, there's the way that the girls go up and they try to do their own abortion that could fail or possibly kill themselves. Some say making abortion illegal will cause women to abort babies in dangerous ways. According to the Center for Disease Control in 1973, 19 women died from illegal abortions and 25 died from legal abortions. An article from the American Journal of Health shows 90% of all illegal abortions were performed by certified physicians. Dr. Bernard Nathanson, the co-founder of National Abortion Rights Action League, admits he and other abortion industry leaders invented fake figures to claim thousands of women are dying annually from unsafe abortions. This simply isn't true. There should be a safe way to do it. Abortion is not safe for women, especially preborn women. It wouldn't be safe for the child, right? Because the child's the one who suffers. But I'm not somebody to judge somebody else for like what they've gone through and if they want to follow up with that. What do you think about somebody saying, I'm anti-slavery, but if somebody wants to own a slave, that's between them? I'm person. Isn't that crazy, right? I like, I'm personally pro-life, but if somebody else wants to have an abortion, it doesn't affect me. If you feel that it is a baby in the womb, it is a human being with uh, intrinsic value, that you should say something to somebody who believes differently. If somebody else says, hey, I'm gonna murder this person, and you said, well, you would hope that I would say something if somebody's gonna plunge a knife into your back, wouldn't it make sense that you would say to somebody else, hey, don't do that, that's wrong? Or would you say, no, let them live their life? That's a valid point. I don't have an answer for that right now. All right, But I Good. will think about it, so thank yeah. you. We're valuable because we bear God's image. Our value has nothing to do with our ability or lack of ability. One of the greatest assumptions people make is to believe that the preborn are not human. It's not argued for, it's only assumed. We need to give people value all the way from the beginning, because if we don't give them value while they're young, why should we give them value when they get older? We consider the algae out there on the seaweed life, so. Isn't it interesting that if we find bacteria on Mars, we would say, Life it's on Mars. Mars. <laughs> There's life on Mars. Yeah. Someone could say that they found bacteria on Mars and Mars has life. Something inside the womb that's developing, that's been created, should also be considered life. Ronald Reagan once said, everybody that is for abortion has already been born. Yeah. Isn't that deep? It's an interesting thought that the child never gets to have a say in the matter. A baby's not able to You've vote. Never Come to the earth, you've never got to have your imprint. Your soul never came here and experienced this. If the preborn are human, then there's not one sane objection that would rationalize killing a baby in the womb. Almost 100% of all abortions take place between the seventh and the 10th week. If you take the eighth week by way of example, the child already has her little organs present. The heart is pumping. The brain is functioning. Arms and legs are growing and developing. This is a growing, living human being. And I don't believe it's a human, but there's potential for life. If a pregnant mother was murdered and the baby dies also, should the murderer be charged with double homicide? Yeah. Yeah, and why is that? Because it's two lives. It's two lives? Yeah. Okay, so you do believe it's a it's a life in the womb? Yeah. Steven, answer this question. It is okay. You are okay with a woman killing the baby in the womb when? Never. So did you just change your mind then about abortion? No, I didn't. I, I, I don't consider ab abortion to be good or positive or anything like that, period. But you allowed up to the woman to choose. Yes, I did. Hmm. But if it's never acceptable, my friend, then it's never acceptable. It's never acceptable. I like that. Right? I like the whole 
So now let me ask you again, did you just change your mind about abortion then? I'm sure I did. Yes, I did. Yeah. So answer this question. Yeah. It's okay to kill a baby in the womb when? It's never okay to kill the baby in the womb, I would think now. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay to kill a baby in the womb when? Never. Yeah. The way I value life, it's precious. And and this right now is a perfect time for us to, to wake up. It is okay to kill a baby in the womb when? I'm now pro-life. I just don't think it's... Never. It's never... Yeah. Murder is wrong. It's biblical. So isn't abortion wrong in all cases then? It's not up to the woman to decide? Go biblically. If you go biblically, then yes, it is. Which is the right way to go, I would say. Amen. You're right. Okay. So now answer the question. It's okay to kill a baby in the womb when? You're right. You got me. No, it's not. It's never right, right? Right. So did you just change your mind on abortion? Change my mind. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Just like that? Just like that. So answer this question. It's okay to kill a baby in the womb when? Never. So you just changed your mind about abortion then? That quick. Yeah, that quick. And on the low, yeah, that quick. Because now that I think about it, it is a baby. I'm pro-life. All lives matter to me, to tell you the truth. All I want to do is just help all the babies in the world. I wish I could just adopt all of them, the ones that are broken without parents. And I wish I could just do that. So then are you saying that you're pro-life in all situations and all circumstances because it's a human being? Yes. So I'm definitely pro-life, I guess, yeah. It's encouraging to see people are willing to change their mind on abortion when they are reasoned with. And when talking with people about abortion, that often led into the issue of morals, where morals came from, and ultimately, the afterlife. Do, do your spiritual beliefs kind of formulate any of your moral decisions? No, no, because I'm not really like a spiritual person. Do you believe in God or an afterlife? There is no God, and if he is, he sucks. I don't believe in God, no. Well, I haven't been to church in, in 30 years. What do you think happens after we die? Um, I don't know. Um, I think about that kind of a lot. I believe in ghosts and that type of stuff. If God were to ask you, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? I don't think I've done like wrong by anyone. Okay. Yeah. When you die, are you going to heaven or hell? I think this is heaven and hell. I'm going to heaven. Why? Because I'm pure. Would you consider yourself to be a good person? Yes. All right, yeah. Pretty good. What if somebody says, hey, being good is plunging knives into people? We think that's crazy. But how are they wrong if they get to decide? I also don't have an answer for that. Do you think God would consider you to be a good person? Probably not. Yes, maybe. You know, he's okay with what he, she, it, whatever, us, we. Mind if I put you on the hotspot for just a moment? Can you handle the heat? Yeah, yeah. All right, let's determine if you are a good person, not by my standard, because you seem great, right? How many lies do you think you've told over the course of your life? A lot probably a lot of lies. I work at a law firm, so. <laughs> when I was younger, quite a few. So you're a younger yesterday. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah. What do you call somebody who tells lots of lies? A liar. Are you still a good person? I'm not a liar. <laughs> I don't think lying is wrong. How many lies do you think you've told over your life? It's too many, probably. Okay. That's probably why lying's not wrong, would you say? Yeah. But how many people do you have to rape to be a rapist? One. How many people do you have to murder to be a murderer? One. How many things do you have to steal to be a thief? One. How many lies do you have to tell to be a liar? I guess one, so I'm a liar. <laughs> I'm a liar. <laughs> it's hard to say, but it's true, right? You shall not steal. I've done that. I have done that before. Done. Yeah. I mean, he stole from me today. What? <laughs> what? Chick-fil-A card. What? <laughs> you know, if I were to reach in your wallet and take a single dollar bill, or if I took a hundred dollar bills, it's irrelevant. Yeah. I took something that belongs to somebody else. Innocent or guilty? I stole some things up when I was a kid. Come on, bro. I'm gonna say guilty. Why you doing me like that, bro? I was a kid. What do you call somebody who steals things? A thief. So what are you? A liar and a thief. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Definitely. Texted OMG. Have you ever used God's name in vain? Yes. Yeah, I said that before you. Yeah, okay. I think constantly on a daily basis. Yes, I have. Yeah. The Bible says that God's enemies use his name in vain. Yes. It's called blasphemy. Right. Would you ever do that with your mom's name? No. Right, because you value your mom. So I want you to consider for a moment what you've done with the name of God. All right, now Jesus said, if you ever look with lust, you're guilty of committing adultery in your heart. Meaning God not only sees the people you're with, but the people we want to be with, or the websites that we visit when no one's around, right? 
right? And that, that, that's, that's, that's for real right there, right? Ever done that? Yeah, I mean, everybody has. Every day, I ain't gonna lie. Every day right now, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it's not my fault I was born this way, but yeah, all the time. All right, so if you've done that in the eyes of God, mm -hmm. you would be an adulterer at heart. Have you always honored your mom and your dad? No, no. Have you ever had hatred in your heart towards someone? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. If somebody told me that they murdered somebody, I wouldn't take it upon myself to judge them. God does not have a less sense of justice than mankind. That if a earthly judge finds somebody guilty, he's going to levy a fine or the person has to do time. He'd be a good judge to do so. I want to say God has a, uh, a better sense of justice than mankind. That every idle word a man speaks, he's going to have to give an account on the day of judgment. Everything you ever have done in darkness, in secret, you think nobody's ever seen this, that you'll give an account because God's eyes are in every place, keeping watch of the good as well as the evil. So you have broken uh, God's law, the 10 commandments. And because you've broken God's commandments, you deserve to be judged, just like here in civil or federal court. I agree, right? yeah. If you've broken God's law and God gives you justice, would he be a good judge if he let you go? No. God gives you justice, would you go to heaven or hell? I'd go to hell. So if God gives you justice, you would go to hell. Does that concern you at all, Charlie? I mean, kind of. Yeah, I'd definitely be in hell. I mean, he's gonna send me to hell. And I think I would be judged. Do you have any idea what God did so you wouldn't have to go to hell? He died on the cross so he could absolve us of all of our sins, so that we could gain that type of forgiveness. So do you understand the legal ramifications of that? No, I don't, actually. Let me, let me tell you what it means and then get your thoughts. If you're guilty of breaking a civil law or federal law and you go before a judge and there's a fine that's imposed upon you the judge wants to see payment being made if there's no payment made well then you have to go to prison two thousand years ago jesus christ stepped into the courtroom to pay the fine for humanity's sins we can be set free we can go free out of the courtroom because our fine was paid by another two thousand years ago God became a man in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was more than just a man. He was the God man. He lived a perfect life. And when he died on the cross, he was unjustly condemned to die. It was the wrath of God that came down upon Jesus Christ so that it wouldn't have to come down upon you when you die. He paid a debt he did not owe because you and I owed a debt we could never pay. We have sinned against a holy God and our sins have separated us from God. And the Bible says that God is not willing for any to perish, but that all come to repentance. Have you heard that word repentance? See what it means? Asking for forgiveness? Not exactly. You can ask the judge for forgiveness. He's not gonna give you forgiveness. It's a Greek word, mentanoia. It means to change your mind. You literally have to change your mind about what you currently believe is going to happen to you when you die and being able to get to heaven perhaps on your good merits or your good outweighing your bad and solely believe and rely upon the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross 2000 years ago. He was perfect, he lived a perfect life and he died a cruel death. Well, as long as you think that you're good, you'll never get right with God. You don't need to get right with God. If he's the savior, what does he say from? He saves not just from hell, but he saves us from ourselves, from our own sin. What God requires of you, my friend, is to repent and we place our trust where God the Father placed his wrath, which is in Jesus. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what God requires of you, Charlie, okay. to repent and place your trust in Jesus. Well, what he's looking for from you is a complete surrender. Somebody who's willing to die for you is now requiring your life back to him. And the way we say thank you is by surrendering, by, by coming to him in faith and saying, I've been living a lie, I've been living a hypocrite, I've been living for myself, and, and I'm sorry, and I was wrong. And the Bible says today is the day of salvation, right? Today's the day to get right with God. And the reason I know that God will forgive you, my friend, is because three days after Jesus died, he rose again from the dead and he conquered the grave. There is no other true story where the hero dies for the villain. You, my friend, are a villain. You must be born again, the Bible says. In fact, there's a man named R.A. Torrey who said, unless a man is born again, he's gonna wish one day he was never born at all. This is why, as the Bible says, it is a fearful thing to fall into God's hands. If, if God's good, well, then he's gonna punish sinners, right? He's not gonna give anybody a pass. And because God is holy, 
He can't allow anybody that's not holy into his presence. So my encouragement is when you get alone, cry out to God to have mercy on you, and he will. You know, 150,000 people die every day. That's 54 million people every year. How old are you gonna be when you die? Don't know. Yeah, yeah, it could be tomorrow. You could have an aneurysm in your sleep, and I don't want that to happen. We don't want that to happen. But the truth of the matter is, cemeteries are filled with the youth as well as old people, right? So will you give this some thought? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. That's uh, deep. It's pretty deep stuff, right? Would you at least think about it? Yeah. Almost cried. Thank you. Absolutely. I'll definitely give this some thought. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I'm going to definitely think about this for the rest of the day. <laughs> it's definitely stored. Normally, I have tons of questions, but right now, I'm pretty satisfied. I'm pretty good. Yeah. I think about this kind of stuff, you know, all the time. Well, cool. Hey, it was good meeting you, Charlie. Nice you I really, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. How you doing? I said I would sign. Yes. But I actually, I disagree. You I, disagree? Okay. I believe God loves me. Yeah. And God loves every one of the cre his creation. And so he has a plan and purpose for him. So he has a plan and purpose for you. The Bible says that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139, okay. 14. So I do not lay, agree with abortions. <laughs> it's not my position. Thank you for coming back. Adelina, really quick. I'm, I'm filming and there's cameras that are hidden over in the corners and stuff, and I'm being mic'd up, and we're pro-life. We're trying to see if people would be willing to sign for the death of children after they're born. We're actually against the killing of people because we are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we've been created in the image of God. And so we agree with you, and we thank you for standing your ground and making your voice being heard. Thank you for coming back. We really appreciate that. I've had an abortion. Um, I was on drugs and I was with a guy who was not a good guy, and I was just out of my, long were you? Out of my mind uh, for three months. I could never, ever do that again. I kept you the ultrasound. I day. think about it every day, all the time. I kept the ultrasound. It never leaves you. Yeah, it never leaves me, and that's something I would never, ever do again, ever. But, um, yeah, I didn't tell you guys? No. Oh, okay, because that's something that I, um, I was just a lot of shame. I, I was not in the right place in my life because I was selfish and I didn't want to turn it around. You know, the baby doesn't have a chance at life because it didn't have a voice because I spoke for it and I, and I hate myself for it. But I, at this point in my life, knowing what I did, I would never do it again. You are valuable. That you have been created in the image of God. You have intrinsic worth. Before you ever had a name, before your parents were deciding between half a dozen names, God knew what your name was going to be. The hard things you've been through, the difficult things you've expressed, the things that you make you cry, your thoughts that you have, or you think nobody else knows that I'm going through these things and you hide it with whether it be alcohol or television, radio or friends. And what God is requiring of you, my friend, is complete obedience to God and his word. The answer is clear. You are you from the moment of fertilization. A unique human being never to be repeated in all of history. Whether you've had an abortion or know someone who has, God solves it with his grace. God's grace abolishes guilt forever. You may be filled with regret for the past. You may be living with a sense of guilt, have great failures in your life. It doesn't matter what you've done. If you were a hundred times worse than you currently are, your sins would be no match for his mercy. The enemy wants to define you by your scars, but Jesus wants to define you by his. If you're telling yourself, you don't deserve a second chance from God, well then I just wanna remind you, you didn't deserve the first chance either. If you've had an abortion, it's impossible to move on, but you can move forward with God's help. What is, what it? is it? It's a baby. It's a baby. It's a baby. A precious life created in the image of God. I'm gonna roll this up a little bit.
So, you're gonna keep it? Leah. Her name is Leah. This is the part when an executive producer usually comes out and says a whole bunch of nice scripted stuff. Well, you know what, friends? This movie is way too important, and the cause that it represents is way too important for me to come on camera and do that. So I wanna shoot straight from the heart. Look, this movie was birthed out of a burden. A burden over the fact that millions upon millions of babies have been murdered inside the wombs of women. Burdened over the fact that millions upon millions of babies will continue to be murdered inside the wombs of women if we don't do something about it. We hope that the movie has hit its mark, that you have been stirred and roused to stand up and do something about it as a people of God. Scripture calls us ambassadors for Christ, and that's our calling. And we hope that one of the things that came through loud and clear from the movie is that the gospel is the true answer to our world's ailments. Without the gospel, really, we're without hope. You just have a world that's been reformed morally, but we want more than that. We want a world that is transformed spiritually, and that happens through the gospel, and that's why we exist as a ministry. If you've been familiar with Living Waters for any amount of time, you know that our ministry's vision statement is to inspire and equip Christians in fulfilling the Great Commission. And you know that we do that in a whole bunch of different ways. Maybe it's your first encounter with the ministry and you're thinking, oh, maybe they just produced this one movie or made a few movies, but we do a whole lot more than that, friends. We've been around since the 1970s when God gave our founder and CEO, Ray Comfort, a burden to reach the world with the gospel. And so currently we have a YouTube channel with over 1.2 million subscribers and growing. We have almost a quarter of a billion views We've got a television program, The Way of the Master, that airs all around the world. We've got a podcast that is now one of the top podcasts on the planet. We have books and we have training courses and we have gospel tracts and so many other things that exist to help equip you to be 
the ambassador you're called to be and to reach the world with the gospel. And so to find out about all of that, make sure to go to livingwaters.com. And by the way, if you happen to have an event, a pro-life event where you'd like a speaker to come out from Living Waters, myself, Ray Comfort, Mark Spence, Oscar Navarro, we would love to come out and to speak at that event. You can find out more about that by going to livingwaters.com and clicking on the speakers tab. And if you happen to be watching this movie and you're pricked in your heart over the issue of abortion because maybe you've had an abortion or perhaps you're struggling with whether or not you should, I wanna urge you to go to heartchanger.com where you'll find resources there that'll help you in your struggle. We want to be there for you, not just through this movie, but for a lifetime in many different ways. And so friends, I can't express to you in words adequately enough how grateful we are that you took the time to watch What Is It? Our hope is that now you'll become activated to go out and to allow the Lord to use you in this world for His glory.